Hi guys, uh, Mr. G here. Hopefully you're all safe and healthy. Um, I'm currently still at home with my dogs and my family. Uh, we haven't driven each other completely crazy yet, although we're getting there. Um, today we're going to start our new unit on World War I. And um, to start, today I'm going to talk about the main causes and the background of the First World War. Um, there's a graphic organizer to go along with this. It's called Main and Background. Um, the word main is actually an acronym that we're going to be using uh, to understand the main causes of the war. So why this matters, uh, before I get into that, our essential question for the day is, what were the major factors that contributed to the start of World War I? So why this matters, first of all, a lot of people are going to die and suffer as a result of this war about 20 million deaths and 21 million people will be wounded. An entire generation of French and Germans will die, uh, meaning 80% of the population, 15 to 49 of males, will just be gone uh, because of this war. Uh, <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of new technologies mixed with old tactics, uh, which does not end up going very well. For example, they have machine guns, chemical warfare, and trench warfare uh, technologies mixed with the tactics of kind of rushing the enemy um, in battalion strength, infantry divisions. And then lastly, this matters a lot because World War I is essential in understanding where we get Nazi Germany from, where we get the Soviet Union from, and how the United States uh, evolves uh, before and after the war. So, uh, lastly, World War II. <laughs> World War II is not possible without the events of World War I and without what happens here. And then that is a picture of the Battle of Kursk in World War II. That's probably one of the biggest battles in human history. Uh, most likely visible from space if you had had satellites up there at the time. Okay. So I do want to talk a little bit about some previous conflicts that took place before World War I. You don't need to know the exact details of a lot of them, but they're important to understand. So in the years leading up to World War I, the European countries like you know Britain, France, Austria, Austria-Hungary, I mean, um, uh, they're all fighting over certain uh, resources, lands, borders, also they want to have the biggest national prestige, meaning they want people to think they're the best. Um, and you see that come again and again in the late 1800s. So by the late 1800s, European countries already don't like each other because they've been fighting wars with each other for the past uh, couple centuries. But in the 18th century especially, you had the Russians fighting the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire, for those of you who don't know, is based out of what is modern-day Turkey and was at one point one of the biggest empires in human history, uh, Britain and France. So the Russians fought against the Ottomans who were sided with Britain and France. Um, the Franco-Austrian War means France fought Austria. Uh, I'm not going to go a ton into that. The Austro-Prussian War, Austria fought Prussia. And then the Russo-Turkish War, so Russia fights the Ottomans again in 1877 to 1878 but like i said those are not super important wars i'll get to the most important one in a minute um so this is a famous picture of the franco-prussian war which i'll talk about in a minute um, and what you see in the picture is basically masses of soldiers fighting close hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, lots of cavalry, people on horses, kind of looks like a mess. Um, and my question to you is how would machine guns or chemical weapons or I mean, even artillery change this kind of fighting? So if you want to pause the video to think about that or write something down in your graphic organizer. Okay, so um, machine guns and chemical weapons would change this kind of fighting in that uh, pretty much anybody who would have charged in this painting would have been killed immediately or after making it about 50 feet, if the people with the nice red hats had machine guns. So it completely changes how casualties work and how, how many people are going to get killed or wounded by fighting. 
Okay, so the Franco-Prussian War, 1870 to 1871, is really important to understand where World War I comes from in terms of France and Germany. Because right now, uh, in 1870, let's say we're in 1868 or 1865, Germany doesn't exist yet, like, is the way you know Germany. It's basically a loose collection of Germanic states, really, with one big one at the head, and that is Prussia. And, spoiler alert, France will lose this war badly. Um... The three main things you need to know about the Franco-Prussian War that are actually really important is this first one. That's actually one of your key terms. France will lose a portion of its territory called the, oh boy, Alsace-Lorraine. I'm going to say the Al-A-Lorraine because I cannot pronounce French. I'm sorry. Um, so the second thing is that France is completely humiliated by this war. Um and the third is that Germany, after the war, becomes a unified empire and becomes you know, Germany as an empire. So that is the A. Lorraine region of France right there and Germany. So you can see uh, it's a really important border territory or border region. And there's a lot of this is also a region, um, a farming region here with good soil. So it's very valuable for both the French and the Germans. And then this is the Franco-Prussian War, as these are the Prussians here, I believe, and they're assaulting the French town of Sedan, or Sedan. Um, this guy right here using a mattress as a bullet shield, probably not the best idea, but the French do end up losing this war, so maybe that's why. Uh, moving on. Okay. So our acronym that we'll be dealing with is MAIN, and it stands for Militarism, Alliances, Imperialism, and Nationalism. Um, so we'll talk about each of these individually later, but the big thing is, you know, clearly here we have big militaries build up. Uh, we have a lot of different alliances. There's imperialism going on, so countries are trying to fight over different parts of the world, like Africa, as you can see here, and then nationalism. So we'll talk especially about nationalism. Um, it's kind of like uh, over-the-top patriotism is my best way of explaining it in under 10 seconds. So the U.S. and neutrality. Um, at first, very, very few Americans wanted to get involved in European affairs. Um, because remember, America doesn't join World War I until later. Um, but at first, many Americans, you know, were very, let's say, skittish about joining the war because a lot of them were either immigrants from Europe or their parents were or their grandparents were, meaning they just spent half their life or, you know, their family had spent their life getting away from Europe and becoming Americans. They don't want to go back there to fight a war that they know nothing about or don't really care about. Uh, but after the fighting started, the U.S. was a major supplier of materials and goods to both sides. That's at first. So at first, we're like, you know, we'll sell to anybody. Uh, the U.S. economy was not doing especially great right before World War I. Uh, but later, we'll mainly support Britain, France, and Russia. And that is a picture, it's actually a pretty amazing picture of a munitions factory. So this is a place where they'd be making artillery rounds, tank rounds, although these are definitely artillery rounds. And what you see here is just stacks upon stacks of explosives. And these would be sent, you know, shipped to the front lines, loaded into artillery guns, and launched at enemy troops. Okay. Uh, this is a really important distinction for you guys to understand. Isolationists versus interventionists. I'm sure you've probably heard of this before. An isolationist is someone who, like, I guess in layman's terms, wants to stay out of other people's business. It's so like, you know, leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. I'm not going to go and invade your country. You just leave me alone and I'll mind my own business sort of deal. So an isolationist would be somebody who does not want to go to war or get involved overseas. An interventionist is the opposite, and this can be for a variety of reasons. They can say, oh, we have to do something, you know, one country is taking advantage of another, or we should intervene because we have a duty to, or we need to make the world safer. So that might be something you might hear from an interventionist. 
Uh, some isolationist views would be, you know, let's not get involved in European affairs. It's 3,000 miles away. Uh, war is evil. Uh, let's set an example for peace. And a lot of people didn't want to send their sons to experience the horrors of war, although a lot of people during this time period still did not fully, uh, they did not have the same access to media and um, video or photographs that we do today to see truly how awful war is. So what you see during this time period especially is some of that um, jingoism that we talked about before, this aggressive nationalism being pushed on people by saying, you know, you're not really a man unless you go fight, or you're not really a true patriot unless you go fight. The opposite is, like I said before, the interventionists, and their argument would be uh, Britain is our ally and we should help them out. So if Germany is assaulting Britain, you know, we got to help out our friends. Also, the idea that Germany is like too aggressive and acting like a bully and that they must be stopped. Um, one of the things that interventionists will point to is the German invasion of Belgium. But the, a lot of the reports of atrocities by the Germans in Belgium were used to fuel anti-German sentiment among the Allies and the United States. So, yes, things were very bad when the Germans invaded Belgium. But, yes, things did get embellished and blown out of proportion. It tends to happen in history. Um, lastly, I wanted to show you guys some of these um, different uh, political cartoons and advertisements. So the one on the left is actually a song. Um, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. And, you know, it says a mother's plea for peace. What you can see up here is her imagining the battlefield and how awful it is. And then not wanting her son right here to go off to war. These are the singers. And then over here we have a, this would be definitely an interventionist poster. It's showing uh, the German Kaiser with his helmet, with a really bloody sword, tons of dead children and people um, wading through them. And it's saying only the Navy can stop this. So it's a recruitment poster saying we need to join the Navy to stop this madness. All right. So um, that's the end of this one. I, if you guys need to rewind it to look at anything, please let me know. Uh, go ahead. You don't have to let me know. Um, I'll keep putting these up this week. Um, and have a good rest of your day.